Well, I'm going to start with a real simple question. I just wanted to actually um, ask if you could give a brief overview of um, the kind of music culture that was at the heart of the two pieces. I mean, of the of the piece in computer and composition, but obviously, especially the Kairos piece. You know, you're, you're talking about garage band. You're talking about what I think now would probably in part be called mashup music culture. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the context in which that piece of yours was developed in terms of you know technology and music at the time. You want to start? Well, sure. I I was really excited about um, having GarageBand. I had just made the switch from uh, PC to working more with Macs, and GarageBand was this really interesting tool, and uh, even the the title, and they had Pro Tools. It's from something Wayne Coyne said, uh, imagining what musics were going to be possible. Uh, I'd just uh, been thinking about things like um, surround sound movies. Uh, I just set up a surround sound in my basement. And, you know, trying to think about what Zurika, the Flaming Lips album in four parts, what that meant for performance in different spaces. And uh, Thomas and I just started hanging out in my basement. He had just introduced me to craft beer, and so we were spending time listening to some really good music and uh, drinking some good beer. And uh, I think after a couple of weeks uh, of doing this occasionally, Thomas looked at me and said, we should write about some of this. <laughs> um, I had been um, starting to flesh out some of the deeper implications of the concept of ambience. Um, I'd already written one essay on it, and it was based on the work of Brian Eno. So I was starting to think about other ways in which technology, new media, and music were intersecting. Um, I flashed back to um, bands like the Beatles, or Yes in particular, um, because of the way they orchestrated all these different elements together in order to create something more akin to a world, a truly immersive aesthetic experience where you've got the artwork, you've got the music, you've got the light show, you've got the lyrics, you've got gestures towards outside culture. And then when we get to the get to the present day, the the potential that bands have just greatly expands because you've got all these digital forms to, to work with now. So Michael and I started talking about how some some of the bands that we were aware of um, were doing that, like the Flaming Lips um, and Sugar Ropes in particular for me, and you know, and other stuff like that. So we we're trying to figure out how is it that um, bands evoke and enter the world or create new pathways for, um, as Engel talks about it, lines. We can think of these as lines of, of significance and, and, and aesthetic evocation. Um, so we were interested in trying to theorize that in some sense, um, not just in terms of the music, but in terms of, well, if we think about this as part of the ground for exploring what new media is and can be, then make that argument. Well, how would we, and how would we illustrate and illuminate that argument? Well, related to something that you brought, you know, you were um, talking about just a minute ago, there's a moment in, in the intro to the Kairos piece when you say new media culture is less resonant with interpretation than with engagement. And to explain this experiential difference, we deploy the concepts of worldling and prosumer. Um, I'm really intrigued by this notion that music, and I would say other um, areas of composition, have moved away from a kind of, you know, interpretive framework toward one of engagement. I mean, how or, or what, what would you want to say about that now since the publication of the Kairos piece? Well, I think about how everyone who saw the Sex Pistols wanted to make a band. And for me, that's, that's a moment that sort of illustrates. We didn't want to talk endlessly about what we were seeing. We wanted to do it. And teaching myself, teaching ourselves, 
how to create podcasting. Podcasting was just nascent in 2005, 2006 when we were writing these pieces. And so the best way to learn how to create podcasts was to do podcasts. So we had written this essay, and I wanted to create something to go with that essay. And so started playing with music, and we spent a lot of time mixing things up, using found sounds, trying to create a mashup that reflected the kind of work that we did. And so, you know, found this this Wagner piece, mashed it up with something that was brand new, just released by the Flaming Lips, and it still sounds wild. I can't imagine that there are a lot of people who are downloading it and listening to it for pleasure. But it was a heck of a lot of fun and also immensely rewarding to start to play with these technologies and to understand how they were working. And so when I'm listening to the Flaming Lips, I'm not thinking, oh God, I want to write about this. I'm thinking, I want to participate in this. I want to make something. And so I think about that moment where you know, we, we get this stadium rock and there's sort of this staid 70s, uh, this is big album rock. And then you get the Ramones and then the Sex Pistols, and MC5, these early punk bands saying, screw it, tear it all down, start again, and make it. And so there's the, the really incredible moment where you see the Sex Pistols and you don't want to write about punk. You want to get a guitar and play it. And you want to get your friends together and and play. Well, okay, so that, that's awesome. I really love that description. And I personally could not agree more with the idea of less talk and more doing, you know. But there's an ambivalence in the humanities and in our field toward that. Um, you see it in the ambivalence in composition toward creative writing. You see it in some of what Jeffrey Circus talked about is the movement away from just talking about pedagogy and what's going on in the classroom in a kind of process-based way to just scholarship itself. You know, he, taught, he kind of laments a bit of the way in which the field is professionalized. Um, and I think about the quote-unquote provocativeness of someone in digital humanities proper like um, Stephen Ramsey, who talks about what digital humanities is about, is building. It's about making stuff. And he got, he got in trouble with some people at MLA for saying that because he was basically saying, stop talking and make stuff. So I'm just wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about the ambivalence. I mean, yeah, there's excitement in wanting to, you know, build and to make and to stop talking or stop doing criticism. But it just seems so hard to get away from that. I think one of the things that um, we were doing is engaging precisely that question, but we we're engaging it in several different le levels. But one of them is, if we're going to take new media seriously, then you have to take seriously how it engages the full person, the full sensorium, and not simply significance, not simply uh, literacy narrowly understood has been the dominant focus of the field. And so music became a key flashpoint for that. But even there, if we look at how new media first entered the field, everyone focused on the visual, as if that was the only thing that was important. Sound got dropped out. And that's interesting. Yeah. Why sound got dropped out? The reason is because we don't have a semiotic for understanding it, whereas we rapidly developed one for visual. Visual rhetorics were hot immediately and the immediately gravitated towards a semiotic like that non-designers handbook by uh, Robin Williams or whatever. Yeah. So, um, but we'll let me, let me, yeah, let sound. Let me that, jump in. Let me jump in then and cut you off right there just so that we're, I can ask this question directly related to what you just said, which is, why, you know, if we look at the excitement around the visual and the lack of excitement around the oral or the, or the sonic as a symptom of disciplinary limitations, then what, I mean, disciplinarily, what, 
what are the investments in our field that we aren't able to engage with music or with sound as well as with the visual? Uh, we, we wrestle with this in terms of the field is so committed to significance across the narrow band of print-based literacy. And anything that falls outside that bandwidth, which is pretty narrow, is just not interesting, or not teachable, or yada, yada, yada. And if it, is, it does come in, it can only come in terms of machine critique or criticism. And that's why that guy got in so much trouble in MLA. Yeah, yeah. Well, I also want to bring up how privileged sight is in Western culture. Uh, interestingly, blindness allows insight. And so you have that Miltonian sense of the genius of being trapped in your unsighted world. Uh, whereas, you know, Leonard Davis and uh, with his disability studies reader, and then his, um, he's the hearing child of deaf uh, adults, deaf parents. And he writes about how often he encountered them being dismissed. So we have that deaf equals dumb. Sound is not privileged in the way that sight is privileged. And text as an input is also a cited privilege. And we also don't hear text in privileged form. It would come in through feel touch, so through braille reading. So through disability studies, we are getting a, a different insight. See, even that language, insight. Yeah. Whereas we can be blind to the truth. And so all these different metaphors that we operate by reveal these values that we have. Uh, and hearing really is an underutilized uh, uh, sense in the, in the, the multi-sensorum and, the, and in the multimodal. Uh, that is changing with podcast. That sound is something that you bring with you. And uh, you know, we were talking about the different modes, exercising and things that we listen to books now, we listen to texts, we hear podcasts, we hear some great ideas. So, so these things are, are breaking down, but we still have a long cultural history of privileging sight way above sound. Yeah. I, yeah. I was reading R. Murray Schaefer's great book, Soundscape, uh, for a class the other day, and uh, he made a great point there that I've been reflecting on, because I'm also teaching classical rhetoric right now, and of course, classical rhetoric is in a moral culture, and that's one of the hearing. But he points out that the concept of the divine in the ancient world was always described in physical or sound-based sonic terms. It wasn't sight-based. I mean, you had your figures of the gods, but in terms of a larger notion of the divine, it's like the Pythagoreans. It's, you know, some cosmic chord. It's the music of the spheres. It's sound-based. So, that's an index for how there was a turn as print entered the culture, it took over. Mm -hmm. And that turn, and with the devaluation or a uh, insensitivity to the, to the role of the sonic. Mm -hmm. That gets us to the next point, which is that if you are going to start attending to the sonic, it requires you to start attending to more than simple significance, especially with music. That opens up production. Because you can't just write about it anymore. You have to find other more modes of engagement. And that, that led us to the prosumer, that led us to all kinds of stuff. Yeah.